Welcome to Not This, Not That, where we push our boundaries of understanding and perception. I am your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello, and I invite you to join me as we open to the possibility that things may not be exactly as you believe, as you've been told, that there could be more, that in our collective consciousness is the potential for the all. You can find Not This, Not That on sacredstoriesmedia.com and on iTunes and all streaming services on the Sacred Stories podcast. Today, we are continuing our our conversation with American mystic, mysteries expert, and best-selling author, Trisha McCannon. Last week, we invited you to push your boundaries of understanding and perception on Jesus as a master initiate of the ancient mystery schools. And today, Trisha McCannon is going to open the door wide for us on the topic of hermetics or the sacred symbol language of the ancients. We'll talk about the real significance of many of the common symbols used today. So welcome Trisha McCannon to Not This, Not That. Oh, hi everyone. It's wonderful to be with you guys and thank you for having me back. So hermetics, hermetics, it's such a cool term, just that word. And and we're defining it as the sacred symbol language of the ancients. Is is that correct? It is indeed. And of course, it comes from the term or the name Hermes. And Hermes was the Greek, a god of wisdom. He was uh, what the Greeks call Thoth, the ancient Egyptian god of wisdom, and who was a master initiate himself and set up mystery schools around the world. So hermetics is a symbol language that is encoded in such a way that it begins to awaken the deeper knowledge contained within the soul itself. In other words, all of us have been up there in the heavenly realms before we came into this lifetime. And whether you believe in reincarnation or not, you know, I can tell you that it is actually true. And so between lifetimes, we return to the heavenly realms where we get an opportunity to learn and grow at a whole different level than we do down here. So these hermetic symbols unlock something within the higher consciousness of the soul allowing us to sort of receive holographic information uh, very quickly and at a very deep level and multidimensionally. So that's why they're so very important. And of course, in our culture today, you know, we're, we're starting to use symbols with computers and things like that. But those are more exoteric symbols like, you know, um, save your work or, um, you know, open a new window or, you know, share your video or things like that. These are esoteric symbols that um, symbolizes, uh, you know, inner things like hope, love, compassion, but far more than just those words, there's an entire body of knowledge and information behind them. So I find that incredibly fascinating because, you know, modern consciousness or modern history would say that, for example, the Egyptians, as an example of the hieroglyphs, that their language was was not advanced, that they used these symbols because in a very simplistic way. And what you're saying is, no, that these are actually encoded with consciousness. They are. In fact, all Egyptian writing happened on three levels. So there's the level where we sort of sound out what it means. There's the exoteric symbol level that looks like a, that looks like a bee. Okay. A flying bee. Why do they put the bee up there? I don't know, but must mean something. (laughs) Okay, but then there's the deeper level, which really comes into the realm of vibration and spirit and uh, what we would think of as magic today, which is really just the the understanding and mastery of spiritual laws of the universe that we're just discovering. Trisha McCannon has put together a phenomenal online course for Sacred You called The Lost Years of Jesus and the Secret Schools of Initiation. And in this nine plus hour course, it's a video course, Trisha goes into tremendous explanation of the hermetics that are embedded throughout all of the ancient cultures. And we'll be posting a link to the course so you can check it out. And I absolutely encourage you to do that. And today, on uh, Not This, Not That, we're going to take some of these common symbols that we see every day, and Trish is going to just blow the doors off and explain to us what their, what their true significance is, their spiritual, um, historical significance. And so, Trisha, we are in the holiday season right now recording this, and so the, the very obvious one for us to start with would be the Christmas tree. 
Well, that's, of course, one of my favorite symbols because, you know, I always love the Christmas tree. I love the smell of it. I love decorating it. They're so beautiful. But I never even thought for so many years, why do we put up a Christmas tree other than the fact that it's stunningly beautiful? I never really thought of it as having a symbolic significance. But once I became a student of the mysteries and later a teacher, it all made perfect sense to me. On one hand, you know, the, the spine of the tree is like our spine. It's straight up and down and these different globes of world. We can, we can say these globes that we put on the tree, the balls, uh, represent, let us say, the planets, the vast variety, the infinite variety of planets that are out there in space, and then the light, of course, the star at the top of the tree represents our finding our own eternal nature. And of course, that's the apex or the epitome with the star in the tree. So, you know, this is connected with the Jewish Kabbalah, the tree of life, but it's not just the Hebrew teachings that teach about the tree of life. We see it in the Egyptian teachings. We see the tree of life in Persian teachings, Indian teachings, Mayan teachings, Celtic teachings, Native American teachings, East Indian teachings. The tree of life is a very universal symbol. And there's a lot to be said about it. And in fact, this may be what the subject my next book winds up being, uh, which I haven't written yet, called Legacy of the Gods, The Tree of Life and the Way of the Return. So because it's such a fabulous subject. And I actually have a whole discourse on this in my online mystery school that I teach that you can you know get through my website, TrishaMcCannaSpeaks.com. But I love the Christmas tree. And it's a great time of year to talk about it. The Tree of Life is, as you said, one of the... Um, important symbols, right, of the mystery schools. It's also, isn't it also represent, representative of the masculine and the feminine? Is there, is there more? Yeah. Yes, in the, in the Kabbalah, really, there are three, uh, let us say, streams that move from the bottom upward. It's like a ladder, really. Uh, so one side is the masculine, one side is the feminine. And, of course, the path that Jesus was teaching was the middle way. Just like Buddha was teaching the middle way, Thoth was teaching the ancient way. And so, you know, on one side we have the kind of the masculine energies that are contractive. On the other we have the feminine energies. Uh, and then we have, of course, the the energy in the middle that goes right up the middle from Malkuth, which is considered the physical world kingdom, to Yasad, which is the astral plane or the emotional plane. Uh, you can't even get onto the tree without going into your heart or your emotions, because if you don't, you can't ever gain compassion. And then eventually we get to where we balance, let's say, Mercury and Venus, which would represent the mind and, let us say, the sensual nature. We balance Mars and Jupiter, which represents the, you know, aggressive nature and the expansive nature, the giving nature. Uh, uh, and we eventually get to the top of the tree where we balance the divine masculine or mother, uh, mother and pr father principles, the masculine and feminine principles, to uh, finally achieve that mastery in the middle. And, of course, the path that Jesus was teaching up the middle was, you know, Malkuth, the physical world, the emotional, eventually going into the heart with Tiparoth, and then going into Gnosis, which, of course, in the Tree of Life is, is represented by the sphere, uh, the hidden invisible sphere, of Da'ath. Da'ath is connected with really Pluto and the death of the ego self in order that the soul might emerge uh, in all of its beauty and glory through direct knowing of the divine presence. This transcends the mind. So there's so much to say about the tree of life. And I know we have other symbols to talk about, but I could definitely talk for several hours about that magnificent symbol. Just sticking with it, just one more moment, another common symbol and associated with Jesus is also the cross. Is the cross connected to the tree of life? It is, in fact. Um, you know, there's a lot to say about the cross. On one hand, we can say it's the grid of time-space that we all incarnate on. On the other, you know, we've got the horizontal part, which is the balancing of the, let's say, left hemisphere and right hemisphere of the brain or the masculine and the feminine. But then we have the vertical shaft, of course, of the heart of the cross, which is connecting our human self in the lower worlds with our higher self in the angelic worlds. And so, really, when we bring that mastery together, 
this is really the path that Jesus was teaching. You know, he says, when we make the two eyes into one, the inner into the outer, the male into the female, the female into the male, then we shall see the kingdom of heaven. So he's talking about the fact that when we balance the masculine and feminine within ourselves and our human and our divine self, we awaken our third eye, we are able to pull back the veils and see into the higher heavenly kingdoms. And then we can achieve mastery. So it's a spiritual technology. Uh, you know, we find that quote in the Gospel of Thomas, which, of course, was kept out of the New Testament, uh, leading people for nearly 2,000 years to really uh, not even know that Jesus taught this spiritual technology. But in this course that I've taught, I've taught for the Sacred U University, I bring a lot of his secret teachings to light. And, of course, you know, I have a book on the Lost Years of Jesus and the Mystery Schools, and we're covering some of that material in this great course. But I also have a book on the Return of the Divine Sophia, where I include some five chapters of his hidden teachings. And I've tried to really weave a lot of those into this, this course that I'm doing for Sacred You. The, another symbol that you already mentioned was the B. Now the B is, is very common in today's, in today's society, but it was also very important to the ancients. It's extremely important symbol, and there's so many different ways because these these mystics were great observers of the natural world. So when we think about a bee, uh, what does a bee do? It produces honey, and in the ancient world, there are only two preservatives: salt and honey. We didn't have refrigeration back then, so you know that's why we have cured meat with salt. So the honey represents the keepers of the nectar of wisdom for future generations. The Egyptian pharaohs were thought of as the beekeepers. So were some of the Persian mystics, like with the Zoroastrian and Saramang societies. They were preservers of this ancient stream of knowledge. If we look at the bee, of course, the honeycomb by itself, you know, as the beehive looks like a multidimensional kind of, you know, uh, dimensional moving up. And if you look up from inside the honey, the beehive to the top, it looks like a circle with the dot at the center, which was the ancient symbol for God or for the sun. Um, and of course, in today's physics, this is the same symbol we use. The dot in the middle is called the singularity, which is the scientific way of saying God, the creator, and the circle is what they call the event horizon, which is the scientific way of saying, hey, everything that God created. They can't say that in science, but that's what it is. And when you look at the honeycomb itself, it's shaped like a six-sided hexagon. So, of course, the flower of life fits into it. The star of David, which is the uh, triangle that points up and the one that points down, which represents the merger of the masculine and feminine. Uh, if you know the alchemical symbols for air, earth, fire, and water, when they're merged, they literally make that six-pointed star. So there's so many things that are connected. And, of course, in time, um, through the shorthand symbolism of this, uh, we find out that the lineage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, which uh, were the Merovingian kings, when they opened up those tombs, they found over 300 gold bees. And, and, you know, in time in the French courts, because Mary Magdalene and there were some of the early apostles that went to France and set up some of these uh, secret schools of initiation, it became the Fleur de Lis. So that's a stylized version representing the transmission of that princely lineage, so to speak. And of course, you know, all of this sort of got conscripted by some of the dark forces that use these symbols for their own, you know, self-aggrandizement without any true spiritual enlightenment. But that's what the Fleur de Lis represents. If you think about it, it's a little curly cue to the left, one to the right. So the the left-hand path, the right-hand path, the masculine, the feminine, and then the way of uh, union in the middle, which creates a beautiful visca Pisces, which is connected with, you know, the ithcus or the fish that Jesus left us as a symbol of union between the masculine and feminine. So there's just so much to say about each one of these symbols. In the course, in the Sacred You course, The Lost Years of Jesus and Secret Schools of Initiation, you go into this beautiful visual a demonstration of the bee and the fleur de lis and the 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 middle way and the chalice and and you tie it all together across the cultures. It, it's absolutely fascinating. 
Well, you know, I think, uh, as I said, a picture's worth a thousand words. And when we can see the evolution of that symbol and what it means, it's like a light comes on in our head and we're like, oh my gosh, it was right in front of me all along, but I really didn't know. And of course, we don't know because most of us weren't trained as initiates. Uh, a lot of this knowledge has been lost. And, you know, because I'm a student of the mysteries and a teacher of the mysteries, it's part of my purpose, I think, in this life to try to bring this uh, beautiful uh, consciousness uh, of unity between all the spiritual paths that at the deeper esoteric levels completely agreed with one another. So we kind of stop all this religious warmongering and division. Uh, I kind of think it's time. Mm, I agree. And the Fort Lee is associated with France, very prominently with France. But I have to say it's also very prominent in Florence, Italy also. It's, it's I think, the symbol of their city. It's everywhere. Well, of course, you know, what has happened is the, the, you know, when the great masters like Jesus come down here, they bring this profound information. Their apostles do the best they can to understand it. And some of them get it. Some of them get part of it. Some of them don't get it at all. And then as the generations go on, uh, you know, there has to sort of be a, a vehicle to move that path forward. And of course, that takes money. It takes a certain amount of political structure, social structure. So what happens is in the beginning, a lot of these secrets were known, but then they either become forgotten, suppressed, not transmitted, deliberately hidden. There's so many things. And so, of course, the Vatican took the symbol later of the bee, and the beehive, uh, and the beehive hat. I mean, with you know, the Pope's hat that has three levels of initiation from the mystery schools, in order to say, hey, we have the mantle of power now. You want to know where the wisdom is? Look over here. And again, of course, in the early days, the church did have this knowledge. And uh, there are many wonderful things uh, that the church has done through the centuries. But there are also many centuries where there was book burning and suppression and killing of people who had this deeper knowledge in order to hide the fact that the roots of it lay in the ancient world in these great mystery schools with masters and sages the world over that knew Jesus was coming, honored him completely, uh, but it's not like there's only one person that has ever come down from the higher worlds to teach us. There have been, you know, the Buddhas and the uh, Mithras and the Zoroastrians and the Osiruses and the Horuses and each one of them has had a piece of the puzzle and of course Jesus was the master initiate and honored by all these traditions as this profound expression of divinity and so of course that's why I've written books on him and why for me he's sort of profoundly central. He's simplified it all into very simple terms, but it's really nice to know the rich tapestry of knowledge and wisdom that he was trained in so that it brings us into an enlightened state of consciousness as well. In our previous podcast, um, I'm Not This, Not That, Trisha McCannon takes us through the ancient mysteries schools from the Druids to, the, to India to the Buddhists ancient Persia, ancient Egypt, and we talk about all of that. And, and it is also included in her course, The Lost Years of Jesus and Secret Schools of Initiation. Again, nine plus hours of personal teaching with close to 2,000 visuals with Trisha McCannon explaining Jesus as a master initiate, the mystery schools, the mysteries in the mystery schools, and the hermetics or the sacred symbol language we're talking about now just as a as a thread throughout and they can actually get the first uh, course free the very first module which is introducing you to the mysteries it's actually free they can just go online click and watch it and if they feel intrigued then they can choose to watch the whole series yeah absolutely there's seven modules and the first one is free simply by visiting um, sacredstoriesmedia.com uh, sacred you and we'll post the link to that Trisha just to stay in the beehive just one more moment and then I do want to get to the chalice and the holy grail but speaking about the beehive makes me realize that a few years ago um, I visited um, Mykonos where the lion's gate is in ancient Greece and that's where King Agamemnon's tomb is and he was the, um, the king associated with Troy the battle of Troy the Trojan War the reason I bring him up is because his tomb is a giant uh, beehive structure. 
and I was fascinated walking into it. It's, it's, um, it's giant and it's a beehive. And I never, I always wondered why would he have a tomb in the shape of a beehive? And <laughs> That's amazing. I, you know, I've been to Greece and traveled to Greece, but I don't think I ever went to the beehive tomb. So I love that story. Uh, well, the lion's gate where the lion's gate is. So Athens is considered ancient Greece and then Mykonos is considered ancient, ancient Greece. Mandelos is ancient, ancient, ancient Greece. And I've been to them all. And, and I'm just, my soul just soars when I'm there. But when I went to the lion's gate in Mykonos, I just had, um, just I, I just knew I was home. It was one of those experiences where the energy was so high. I was like, you could just leave me here because I'm home now. But King Agamemnon's tomb is giant, and it is a giant beehive structure. And I, I have to yeah. obviously be, has to has to do with the hermetics of the beehive. Yeah, wow. And of course, the lion's gate. The lion was always an ancient symbol that was connected with these great solar lords, the, the lords that represent the you know the light of the world. And um, you know, we talk about in the course how Jesus was initiated within this great order. It was considered the highest of the orders in Egypt, uh, the Pantheras. That's why, you know, you hear references to Je Jesh Yeshua or Jesus ben Panthera. You know, um, it, it was Jesus, son of the, the panther or the pan, that means all, uh, Thera, that's mother, like Theo is divine father, uh, Thera is divine mother. So, you know, um, we see this lion associated with um, the disciple, I think, Mark, uh, in the city of Venice, for example. Uh, we see it connected directly with the great lion of God in uh, the Hebrew teachings and um, the house of Judah. So, I mean, there's just, there's the house of David, you know, there's, there's just so much to say. As you know, I, I actually explain a lot of these symbols in, in my course, so. In your course and in, and in your books. In your books. My course and in my books, yes. So can we talk about the Holy Grail last? I love that one. Yes, so we're going to talk about the Holy Grail. I just want to remind listeners, they're listening to Not This, Not That, and we're speaking with American mystic, mysteries expert, and best-selling author, Tricia McCannon, and our topic today is Hermetics, which is the sacred like symbol language of the ancients. And so the Holy Grail, Tricia, what can we say about that? Well, of course, you know, there is a lot to say about it, and we only have a little bit of time. But I will say, of course, that the, the symbol of the chalice was a symbol that represented the path of mastery that Jesus and Mary Magdalene, after Jesus had left, later taught. Certainly, he was, uh, she was his apostle. He called her the apostle that knew the all, the apostle of apostles. And after the crucifixion, even though he stuck around for about 90 days to teach his apostles and disperse them to different countries, Mary Magdalene then became the head of the inner church, just as Peter sort of became the head of the outer church. And most people don't know that today, but there was actually meetings in the Isle of Cyprus where Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus's uncle, had a palace. And about every three years, people would come from all over the Mediterranean and the uh, Druid world to meet where Mary Magdalene would be the major teacher in the morning. And then the afternoon, everyone would you know, discuss and talk and figure out how to uh, share their experiences and so forth. So Mary Magdalene is very much connected with this quest for the Holy Grail, which is represented by the chalice, which of course the chalice has a bowl uh, that represents the divine feminine. It has a stem that represents the divine masculine. It has a base, which has to do with being grounded in earth. And of course the chalice itself is open to receiving, let us say, the nectar of heaven. So um, the Holy Grail became a symbol for many things among them the path of mastery the path of union between masculine and feminine but also in the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene the whole story of King Arthur and the round table, which is connected with the feminine, uh, the Fisher King, whose, whose side is pierced, whose groin is wounded. You know, in other words, it, you know, how come there's no fertility in the land? Where's the child? Where's the fecundity or the fertility? It all really had to do with the loss uh, and the search for the descendants of the Merovingian kings or the, 
descendants of the of the Christ lineage. And um, of course, I have a whole module about this in Sacred You. So there's so much to say about it, but that at least gives people a little clue about why that incredible story about King Arthur and his knights and the round table and the Holy Grail and you know, uh, right makes might, not might making right. What this is really about, and, you know, it really has to do with the reclaiming of that sacred feminine. And of course, after uh, the round table fell uh, in the mid 500s, pretty much the patriarchal uh, structure came in and took over and then we had you know the suppression of reincarnation with the suppression of the divine feminine uh, we had the book burning we had the heretic killings we had then the six centuries of the inquisition and a lot of other things and um it's, you know, we can, most people don't know a lot about this history, but I think it's important for us to realize what we've lost so that we can wake up out of the dream and reclaim this wisdom for our time. We're moving into a new age. We're at the end of the age of Pisces, thank goodness. So at the end of the age of victim, victimizer, and we're moving into an age of uh, balance and enlightenment where we can truly change the paradigm of the world and embrace these concepts um, of higher wisdom, knowledge, and unity. And I think it's about time, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think it is. It is long overdue, actually. So so we've been speaking with Tricia McCannon, and we've been speaking about hermetics, or the sacred symbol language of the ancients. And what we've done today is just, we've just scratched the surface on this fascinating topic, and Tricia McCannon dives really deep in the course at Sacred You, The Lost Years of Jesus, and Secret Schools of Initiation, uh, going into so many other um, so, so hermetic symbolism that is embedded throughout all of the mystery schools and the connections between all the different cultures and and what's fascinating Trisha and so, although not surprising is that the symbols show up across all the cultures that they, that they all knew about them and the information that you shared today that these symbols are actually encoded with consciousness that it is not just a simplistic language is um, I think just blows the doors off. It does. It does indeed. It really unlocks our higher awareness, awareness that at a soul level, I think most of us have, but we just didn't know how to access it. And so this is one of the great reasons uh, that I teach and that I've been long been a student of the mysteries. So anyway, I hope people will join us for the course. And I hope you enjoyed this wonderful little podcast. It's only my second podcast ever. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So Trisha McCannon, again, is a mysteries expert, American mystic, and best-selling author of four books. Her website is trishamccannonspeaks.com, and you can also find her at sacredyoulearn.sacredstoriesmedia.com, where you'll find information on Trisha and this amazing course that she has put together for Sacred You, The Lost Years of Jesus and Secret Schools of Initiation. So today, we've talked about hermetics, we've talked about the tree, the bee, the beehive, the cross, the Star of David, the Holy Grail, and we are just opening the poss- we're opening the conversation. There is so much more. So I invite you to continue your studies. I want to thank you, Trisha McCannon, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. And we invite all of you again to join us again. This has been Not This, Not That, and I am your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello. Thank you.